Good morning, everybody, or good, whatever it is, wherever you are. It's episode seven, season two, Tad Talk. Um, the, the week's flying already. It's been a crazy week. And uh, today we've got two fantastic guests, about 6,000 miles apart. Uh, I have a feeling this show is going to be a bit of a belter. Um, first guest uh, over here in Las Vegas. Uh, what a career. I don't know how many years it's spanning. I'm going to guess about 20 or 30 um, with a phenomenal uh, band, in uh, in Branson and now uh, starring with Bill Medley and the Righteous Brothers in Vegas. Welcome to the show, Bucky Hood. Hi, Bucky. Hello. Th- thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Great. Have it. Or as we would say in Manchester, Bucky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got a couple of, uh, of, of vocal students I work with from uh, Ireland. They do the same thing. Hello, Bucky. <laughs> oh, unless you're a scouser like all my family is Bucky. Bucky. <laughs> Bucky. <laughs> So welcome to the show. Thank and you. Also on the show, someone I've never met before today, but we've we've crossed a zillion paths in conversations for many, many years. Um, well-known um, UK producer and guy, I don't know how many shows, but it's got to be in the hundreds or the thousands. Welcome, John Conway. Hi, John. Hello to everybody from England. I live just near Windsor in a lovely little village called Gerard's Cross. And when the Scouser says Bucky, you're quite right, Terry. It sounds like they're clearing their throats. Bucky. <laughs> Bucky. It's, it's funny. My, uh, my son was born in Fazakhali. Oh, Fazakhali. Yeah. I'll tell you something. You can only imagine how many ways people can mess that name up. <laughs> Bucky. Yeah. Well, my son was born in Fazakali and lived in Blackpool till he was six. Then we moved over here. So full American accent, but his heritage is Liverpool. So he's very into everything Liverpool. And he's got a brilliant Scouse accent, but he cannot do it unless he swears. <laughs> Can't do it. So <laughs> it's brilliant. Well, the TED Talk again, we're going to start in the way we do with three random questions. These two have got amazing careers, so uh, definitely stay tuned to this one because we're going to go back in time and you're going to be amazed at some of these stories. So here's the first question. Dead easy, this one. I'm going to start with you, John. What was the best live concert that you ever attended? Maybe not something you produced, but what was the best live concert you ever attended and where was it? Um, it was Michael Jackson at Wembley Stadium. Oh, wow. And whatever, whatever happened in the last 20 years, when he was in his prime, it was the bad tour. It was just astonishing. And not just him, but what he inspired in the crowd. It was phenomenal. Oh, I bet. My wife and I had tickets for the This Is It tour, which never happened. And one of our big reg- regrets. How close to the stage were you? Oh, two or three miles away. It was. <laughs> no, to be fair, I was really lucky. I had seats in the Royal Box, and and he he performed at the like the goal end, you know, on a football pitch. So we were kind of halfway, and we were guests, um, not of his, but of the producers, and it was cool. Oh, brilliant! That's that's fantastic. Can't have to top that. What about you, Bucky? Well, I don't know. If I can top that. <laughs> But uh, well, this is going to sound weird, and, and actually, uh, you know, Bill, Bill Medley makes fun of me for this very thing. But uh, I grew up a big Kiss fan, man, and I, my parents would never let me see him when I was a kid for, you know, many, many reasons. <laughs> but uh, I finally got to see him in 2000, and they were with touring with Aerosmith. So, I mean, what two headliners, and it's Kiss and Aerosmith, and I saw him, it was an outdoor amphitheater in Kansas City, and I can't recall the name of it, but I, and I was on the second row. And uh, I remember Gene Simmons comes up and he points right at me and I'm with a, a buddy of mine and he's sticking the tongue out, you know, and pointing and I'm like, I'm drinking my beer saying, look, Gene's pointing at me. And he said, look behind you. And there's five hot chicks right behind me. So, uh, <laughs> I blew my uh, dream there, but. <laughs> you know, the best concert I've seen, and it's for a very different reason. Um, we went to see Billy Joel in Phoenix about, um, it's probably about 15, 16 years ago now. And we've seen Billy a number of times. But on this day, our son was eight years of age, nine years of age. And we, we got three tickets. And they were separated. We had one right in the middle, right at the front. And then two that were up at the side, about eight rows up. And so my wife and I, we just we tossed up for the tickets. And she got the one right down in the middle. And I went up at the side with my son. And um, halfway through the show, Billy Joel came up to the side on a keyboard that span around on a, on a swivel and did a Don't Ask Me Why. And he was about 20 feet from us. And I saw 
the glint in my son's eye wow. when he was that close. And his life changed. He become he, he went. He came home, jumped on the piano, and that's what he does now. He plays and sings, and and it was all because of that moment watching Billy. Yeah. Wow. Brilliant. Is there is there a concert? Is there anyone you you haven't seen that's still around, John? That um, you'd love to see in concert that you haven't seen? No, I think I remember taking my mother to see Sinatra at the Albert Hall. Um, I just don't think those kind of acts are around. And the problem is that you see them in a big stadium now. Uh, and I, I, I saw Barbara Streisand, by acquaintance, sat next to Elton John, and that was there as well. We were only about 10, 15 rows from the front. But when you see a maid star and you're that close and there's a special intimacy, although I do arena shows myself now, it, it just you know it isn't the same as seeing an act like in a Vegas showroom, you, yeah. you know, like where, where Buck is and you can go there and see somebody close up. So I think yeah. that's what I miss that you can't always see an act so intimately. Yeah. What about you, Bucky? Anyone you haven't seen? Ah, uh, gosh, um, I've, I've seen I've seen a, there's 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 one group that's one of my favorites that uh, my wife got to go and see and and I and I missed it and it's you know, I'm hoping they come through Vegas a good bit, but I'm a big fan of Earth, Wind, and Fire. And, uh, and, and I, and Philip Bailey is still just singing his face off. It would be either that or, um, or Tony Bennett. Um, you know, he's, he's still out there doing it. We, we performed at the 50th anniversaries for Caesar's palace. And he came on right after us with just his piano player and saying, I left my heart in San Francisco, which is my favorite old standard. I mean, and jumped up and nailed those high notes. Like it was nothing. I mean, I just had tears running down my face yeah. uh, and I'd love to see his full concert with his full band. Yeah. Is it, I saw him a couple of years ago in Phoenix. Fantastic. I've never gotten to see him. My answer to that is a strange one, especially John's going to think this is pathetic, but um, I am a massive Gilbert O'Sullivan fan. Like you'd never believe. And I get, I get ribbed about it and give shit about it from everybody. Um, and uh, my son and my wife and daughter-in-law bought me tickets to see him in LA. And I was, I mean, I, I literally cried when I got the tickets at Christmas and then the show was canceled. Oh my gosh. Still Terry, Terry, you don't know this. Let me tell you. My first series I produced at BBC was a show called Rock With Laughter. You may remember I did it live in Blackpool for many years. And we got a series of it on BBC with Bobby Davro as the host. And Bobby and I were huge Gilbert fans. Anyway, he knew Ray quite well and he rang him and he was our very first guest on the series. And I'd never met him before, but been a fan since I was 14 years old. So... I had that concert right in front of me and on the, on the run through in the afternoon, he just sang alone again. And it was just me sat there watching it. <laughs> this is driving me nuts. I, I, we just, um, I mean, with this whole show could just be talking about Gilbert or so. Uh, Bucky, do you know much about Gilbert other than alone again, naturally? You know, I, I, I unfortunately I, I don't, and I'm kind of embarrassed to say that. Um, <laughs> Don't go down that wormhole because you'll be here. We were here. We had uh, my son and, his, and daughter-in-law to be came up. I was at the house and we we were sat outside putting up a fire and they were helping us put up this gas fire thing that we got outside. And on Spotify, I put the uh, Gilbert playlist. And so, I mean, we did the whole no matter how I try you, I could do, I could dale, nothing rhymed. But then I started getting into permissive twit and... Uh, Heaven help our Linda. She's really done it now. <laughs> What's more, it's also obvious. I mean, the I mean, stomach sticking out. Let's not. We could do two hours on this guy. I didn't know that, Terry. I didn't know you were a fan. Oh, just massive, massive. When this is over off camera, we'll have to talk about it. Who was it is my favorite Gilbert song ever. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Um, I'll, be, I'll be checking into this. <laughs> yeah. He's a brilliant lyricist, but uh, anyway, I'm going to bore everybody on this show. <laughs> Go down the Gilbert O'Sullivan wormhole because he's amazing. But that's great, John, that he was on the show and being a fan and being right next to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's crazy. I'm a bit obsessed with it, to be honest. But I think. <laughs> All right. Um, next question. I'm going to start with you, Bucky. What's the best advice you would give to um, upcoming talent in our industry? Um, um, well, I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, I've taught musical theater and I've taught uh, vocals at, at a couple of different schools. And, uh, um, and I always tell them if they're wanting to get into this business, uh, you have to have, I think the most important thing, or obviously talent, but other than that perseverance, 
Um, you, you can't let other people dictate your, your dreams and you have to, uh, you have to know that there's nothing going to stand in the way between you and, and what you want to achieve. And, um, and you got to have thick skin and, uh, you know, um, you gotta be like Rocky, you know, you, you're going to get turned down way more. I mean, I've been turned down and turned down and turned down. And then I finally get, was blessed to, to, to have the opportunities that I'm having now, you know, because I didn't give up. Yeah. I refused to give up. And, uh, you know, in addition to that, and I'm probably answering this a little longer than I should, but in addition to that, if um, I tell them, if you're going to the, if you're going, if you're thinking of going into the business and it, it is show business for a reason uh, and, and you are already going in, you have a backup plan in mind then just do the backup plan, you know, uh, <laughs> go ahead and do that because you've got to be in it heart and soul and and have a drive and perseverance but that's my word for from from when i'm teaching even the young kids it's a perseverance is the most important thing absolutely what about you john what advice well, take a slightly different more pragmatic view um having been an agent and manager for many years and my son is 22 and he wants to do stand-up and he's also an actor and he's had a little bit of success doing some tv stuff and a movie that we made but i said to him be prepared to have another skill and to do another job because however good you are, and I say this to lots of people ask me for career advice, however good you are, you will not be working every day of every week. So have something that stops you from becoming depressed, have something that gives you a chance to earn some money and not lose your dignity that all the time you may be being knocked back because even the most successful people only work a few weeks of the year. And so he's worked a little bit helping with property business and uh, he's learned to do websites. But I say everything is a rehearsal. When you're going to be an actor, every day you're rehearsing, you're learning something about human nature. So that, that, that's my advice. Be prepared to uh, earn a living and pay the rent. No, yeah, I, I, and I, yeah, I hundred percent get what you're saying, John. I, I, I just think if they are, uh, you know, uh, if they're going in, you know, in your first approach, I, I tell my daughter, my daughter's a dancer and singer and she's playing, uh, playing guitar. And, and I tell her, I said, you know, uh, be as well-rounded as an entertainer. If you can play guitar, you can go into a bar and make money. You can go down to New Orleans and throw a hat on a street corner and still do what you love and make money. I mean, I've been very blessed. I'm very lucky and blessed to where I haven't had to do anything but what I love since I got out of college in 89. I've been performing on a stage somewhere. Um, I've been in a, a snowman suit a couple of times <laughs> running around a theme park, but I've been entertaining, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's good. I, I agree. I agree, John. It's nice to, particularly if you have some like website skills and things like that, because you can also use that for yourself as an entertainer sure. in your own business. Yeah. And then, you know, I would add to it, forever stay grateful that we're in the industry. And if you're able to pay your bills and do what we do, get on the stage or as in general space, get behind the scenes, be grateful for that because it's an amazing industry. And if you're able to sustain yourself in it, I think we're the luckiest people have you heard the saying, uh, my granddad used to say, and I'm sure you guys have heard this, he goes, if you can find something that you love to do and make a living at it, you'll never work a day in your life. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've got loads of comments coming up here on the, uh, uh, on the, on the feed here. I'm just looking, someone just commented, uh, Tony Bennett called somebody's father-in-law and said happy birthday to him. But um, Jan, who runs our cruise division, Bucky just said that you have a gorgeous head of hair. <laughs> Not you, John, not me, just Bucky. <laughs> That's what she said. Here's the last random question going to you, Bucky. What was the last gift you ever gave to somebody? Yeah, um, uh, I, I think, and I'm thinking more in terms, uh, I've got, a, I've got a, a student of mine that, that just loves to sing. He is, uh, He's a decent singer, but my God, his heart is in it. He works so hard and uh, just going through some tough times, obviously, and can't afford, uh, can't afford for, to pay for lessons. So I just told him, I said, look, don't worry about it. You can, yeah. when you become famous, you can, you can just, you know, throw me a shout out or something. So uh, I, I, I offered him my services, just, uh, just, just try to help him. Good for you. What about you, John? Last gift you gave someone? Um, a few years ago, I had a, bit of a life change. We won't bore you with that now, but as a result of which I perform a random act of kindness to a stranger every day. It may only be smiling at somebody. It may be giving up my seat on a train, 
but that's what I do. And yesterday, it just comes on, it's true. I'm cycling around the lovely leafy area where I live and I see an old couple walking and they've fallen over into a hedge. Okay. Now the lady is very ill. They're both in their eighties. The lady is very ill. So I get cradle her, put her on the floor, prop her up and I say to the guy, go and get your car. I don't, um, uh, don't ring an ambulance get the car and I'll go with you to hospital. Let's get your wife sorted. So he goes to get his car and I'm talking to this lady who is making no sense to me. And I think she must be really ill because she sounds delirious. Her husband got back and I said, look, you know, I'm doing my best, but she, she's kind of not making any sense. He said, no, I did not tell you she's Danish and she doesn't speak English. <laughs> <laughs> I figured she had a seizure. It turned out she was only dehydrated, but Oh, thought, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> That's brilliant. Oh. So now you don't do random acts of kindness anymore, right? <laughs> it, was, it was the day before yesterday, so. That's brilliant. Oh, that's great. That's brilliant. I think those are the best three questions I've ever had on this show. Certainly the answers. That's brilliant. Um, so like I said, two, two um, people on the show here with long, long careers. Uh, we're going to talk to Bucky about his career. Um, I don't know where it started before Branson. I know about that long career you had with, uh, with the band. Was it the Horn Dogs? Yeah, the Horn Dogs. Yeah. What, we what about before? Um, how did it all start for you, Bucky? Uh, well, I, I grew up, uh, I'm a Southern boy. I grew up in Alabama, a little small town. If you've ever seen the Andy Griffith show, that's where I grew up pretty much. Uh, great. I wouldn't change it for anything. You know, great, good Southern hospitality, wonderful place to grow up. And uh, in uh, sang in church my whole life and just developed a passion and love for singing and uh, ended up going to Auburn University. I got my degree in theater there. Uh, and uh, following that, you know, I went to work at a, some small repertory theaters in the Southeast. And and uh, and then I just heard about these cruise lines and how that's a good place to kind of springboard your career as a singer. So I went to work for uh, Miller Reese Productions out of Miami doing review shows and eventually worked Royal Caribbean went in house. So um, I got to do uh, cabaret shows and those type of style shows with a 12 piece orchestra uh, for Royal Caribbean ships for four years. And started hearing about Branson, Missouri at that point. And back in the early 90s, uh, I'm sure you guys are aware Branson was. Uh, I mean, you, you 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 drive down the strip and you would have like Johnny Cash, um, Willie Nelson was there, uh, Ray Stevens, Lee Greenwood, uh, Andy Williams, Mel Tillis. The name, I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, and it was, it was just an unbelievable 2000 seat theaters packed every night. It was an unbelievable time to be in Branson. So my wife and I moved there in 94 and, um, and, and just had tremendous success. Both of us were able to, to do what we loved and make a living. My wife's in the business as well. And, uh, and then I, and then I ran into, uh, uh, Bill, Bill, as you mentioned, the Horn Dogs. Bill came into town in 2007, I believe, to run Dick Clark's American Bandstand Theater, and him and Paul Revere and the Raiders were there. And uh, we, the Horn Dogs, were the late night party band on which ten piece horn band. We played every Saturday night. This club called Shake It Up. It seated about 400 people, and we'd pack it out every every Saturday. And we'd have like the Gatlin Brothers would come on stage with us, or you know, Bill would get up, or you know, Johnny Lee, you name it. Any of the big names that were in town would come over, and they would get up on stage with us and sing. And it was just a big party. So I got to be buddies with Bill. You say a 10 piece horn band? What's that? You say 10 piece? Yeah, 10 piece. We had, well, and sometimes it ended up being bigger. We'd start, we had four horn players, <clears throat> full rhythm section. And then, but there were at the time, you know, Bobby Vinton was in town. So he had, he was playing with a Glenn Miller orchestra. So there were, there were horn horns in every show. So sometimes we'd end up with, 10 horns up on stage, you know, playing, uh, and we just have a huge jam session. And then you'd have like Bill Medley on stage with 10 horns. And, and so Bill and I got to be, got to be friends and I hadn't run into him in a long time. I was actually working for a show called legends in concert, which they have shows all over the United States. And, uh, and I was doing different tribute artists at the time. I did Bob Seger. I, I was part of a blues brothers tribute. I did the John Belushi flipping around on stage and, and, uh, and all that. And, uh, and I quit that and started teaching, uh, Branson kind of over the years, like when Andy Williams passed away and I, I was very fortunate. I got to sing with Andy and perform with him and, and it was just such a blessing. But when Andy passed away, it's kind of like one by one, the greats like Mel Tillis and all of them just either left or weren't able to do it anymore. Nobody came in to replace them. So Branson kind of, kind of went down, kind of 
it's still a nice town with some entertainment, but it's not what it was. And anybody will tell you that. But uh, so I ran into Bill, hadn't seen him in a while and ran into him at a wedding. And uh, he said, oh, you left Legends, man. Uh, what are you doing these days? I said, well, I'm teaching and I'm doing this Journey tribute at the time. I was singing a Journey tribute. And he said, you do Steve Perry? And, and I said, well, yeah. And he didn't look like he believed me. So I said, why don't you come to the show? Well, unbeknownst to me, he went to dinner with a friend the night, the, that night and said, Lucky said he's doing this Journey show. I just, I can't, I can't hear him doing that. I mean, he, he'd heard me sing some other, he said, I, so he calls me five minutes before we go on stage the next day and says, hey, I'm going to come by. I might just stick around for one song, but I just want to come in. So basically, I told him, you wanted to come in and watch me die on stage. He goes, yes, of course. He goes, what do singers love more than watch other singers die on stage? It's great. So he came in. He said he came in for seeing me sing one song. He stayed for the whole first half. The next night, I was doing a Creedence Clearwater Revival tribute, and uh, he came in and heard wanted to hear me do Fogarty, and then he invited me to Fuddruckers uh, <laughs> to have lunch. And said, listen, my manager has been after his Bobby died, the Righteous Brothers back together. And, and I've sang with a bunch of people and I'm not saying that it's going to happen, but would you be interested? Can I throw your name in the hat? And I said, he goes, it might not ever happen, you know. And I said, yeah. He said, you know what? Let me talk to my wife about it. But yeah. And so uh, anyway, he he, uh, he called me like three days later and invited me to go to Level 2 Steakhouse, which I graduated from Fuddruckers to the Steakhouse. I was like, OK, what's up here? And, and uh, he said, why don't you come over to the house and let's sit around the piano. So Bill sit at the piano. It was surreal to me, you know, playing Love and Feeling and Soul and Inspiration and all these songs. And we're harmonizing and he's recording it. And I sang a little bit of Unchained Melody and he sent it to his manager. And he told me later, he said his manager started crying on the phone and said, man, it sounds like the Righteous Brothers to me. And uh, so he called. He said, OK, well, you know, this blah, blah, blah. And it kind of went away for a month. I was at a concert with a buddy of mine whose father just passed away. And I, I, I took him. I said, I want to take you to get, get your mind off of it. So we went to see Van Halen and Kenny Wayne Shepherd, And we're in the in the hotel room getting ready, having some drinks, getting ready to the show. And uh, Bill calls me and says, well, he said, we got three months at Harris. He goes, that's all we're guaranteed. You have to leave everything, though. You got to leave your family, leave you know, your show, your students, everything for, and it's only three months. I can't promise you anything past that. So, uh, we, we, I jumped on it and said, yeah, I'm with you, man. So, uh, and here we are five years later. So it's been, uh, oh, been incredible. Yeah. Still goes, man, I don't, I just don't understand why it's still working. One of the shows we did a few years ago and then I'll stop. I'm sorry. I'm talking on too long, but, uh, we're, we're, we're playing in somewhere, I think at Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It's about a 12, 1300 seat theater. And Bill says, and you know, this is about two years into it. And he says, I want you to come look at something. He, and I'll never forget this. He carries me over to the window. He looks out and he said, there's a line, you know, of people coming in because, you know, we've been selling out. It's been wonderful. And he said, <laughs> he said, I want you to look, uh, look at, look at all the people that are coming in to see our show. And I said, yeah, man. He goes, that's pretty cool. It has his arm around me because it's pretty cool. I said, it's awesome. He goes, I want you to pay close attention to their age. You better be saving your money. <laughs> <laughs> We saw the, uh, my wife and I saw the show, I think it was at Harris. Is it yeah, Harris? yeah, that's where we're doing a residency. So good. I mean, just Bill still got it. Oh, and, he's incredible. Yeah, and you were fantastic. The band, I mean, it was great. Um, I believe we've got some uh, video we're going to go to. Check out Buddy, Bucky here. Time of my life. I keep your love. Bring back that love. The other day, my family took a trip to the zoo. There were orangutans, birds are singing, elephants too. The coolest thing I noticed on our visit that day was that each of them was different in their own special way. Be proud of who you are, cause there's no one else like you. You're a shining star, so if anyone tells you you should be like this or that, tell them you're proud of who you are, cause who you are is where it's at.
You look like meat, meatloaf on the bookie. I know, man. I was like, I'm going to the man. I feel like I'm going to sing Bad Out of Hell soundtrack. <laughs> so, uh, I'd like to work for Legends. Maybe I should think about that. <laughs> so tell us about uh, the new song, We Stand. I know it's been written in this. It's uh, funnily enough, two days ago, my son wrote a song called Earth Without. What is Earth Without Art? It's a cool song. And we talked about it on the show. And yours is written for the, under the same circumstances. Yeah, uh, you know, and to tell you the truth, I wrote the song initially uh, uh, back in 2008 when um, Branson got hit by a tornado, and the they approached me about writing a song about the rebuilding of the town, and uh, and and so you know it was so particular to that moment. You know, I talked about February. It was a leap year tornado, February 29th. And uh, and so it was so specific. And I mentioned Branson. And I was just laying on the couch in about two weeks into quarantine. And I thought, God, you know, I really need to revisit that song and, and, and rewrite it to make it more universal. Because the message, you know, it, it really is, is done all it can do at this point. Because unless we have another leap year tornado in Branson, uh, it's, you know, it's just dead. And I called the, uh, the guy that my the engineer that helped me uh, do the song and just asked him i said by any chance do you still have the tracks this is eight years ago and he said you know he goes i do he goes i've changed programs let me see what i can do so he went and remixed sent it to me i went into the studio here rewrote the song uh put some different instrumentation on it and uh and updated it and uh and made it for yeah for what we're going through now the streaming platform spotify all that kind of good stuff is it available on them uh, yes, it's it's on it's on iTunes. Uh, you can they can also go to YouTube if they look up we. There's two we stands on there. There's the Branson one. But if you look up we stand words and music, Bucky heard. Uh, they can see it's a lyric video. It's kind of simple. I just wanted the people to focus on the words. That was more important to me. But yeah, it's on iTunes on on all the you know you can you can go on those as well. Cool. Let's check it out here. This is we stand by Bucky Heard. We fall down, but some way somehow. By God's grace we stand We stand up We stand strong We stand for one another We stand to right the wrong We stand through the good times We stand through the pain Heart to heart Tremendous. You know, just off camera there, John asked you if you've always had that range. Yeah, I, I started, I was an A-flat singer and uh, for a long, long time, uh, you know, on a, an A on a good day. And uh, when I started teaching, um, it was amazing, man. I just got into a rut. I, you know, I was singing in the same range and I'd gotten into this rut. And when I started teaching my students, I was seeing things in them and it was unknowingly reflecting on myself, bad habits I had developed and, and my range started going up. You know, uh, I always say God was preparing me to take on this righteous brothers thing because, you know, now I hit a, when I, I do crying by Orbison as my feature in the show, because Bill wanted me to do something that wasn't, that so people wouldn't compare me to Bobby. He said, I want you, we come out of the show, as you know, and do Soul Inspiration, Little Latin Loopy Lou, uh, some of the hits. And then he said, I wanted, I'm going to leave the stage and I want you to sing a featured song. And he asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, um, I always love to do uh, When a Man Loves a Woman. It's one of my favorite songs. That's my money song. And he said, that's not it. So he comes back the next day and says, I want you to do Crying by Roy Orbison. And you should have seen my face. I'm like, Elvis calls him the voice. This is Roy Orbison. And he's got a different voice to me. He said, I've heard you do Steve Perry. I want to do your own version of it. And I'm going to make build the arrangement around you. And he did build this beautiful arrangement. And, uh, and I have to, I go up to a D above high C and full belt voice, which uh, is unheard of to me, you know, that, that my, my range and I am able to do it every night. And it's, and I, and I owe it all to my, my kids that I teach, you know, it just helped me, to realize mistakes I was making. You know, when you're working with somebody, you often see a reflection of yourself. So, uh, yeah, well, for anyone watching, go down that wormhole of, uh, of uh, YouTubing and Googling Bucky Hurt because it's a voice, it's amazing. Thank you. I appreciate that. Amazing. I can't think of anyone better you'd want to capture the magic of Bobby. And Very you're kind. Uh, I hope he's looking down and he's happy, man. I'm just standing in for him. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. John, um, the, the term, um, 
and you're probably going to hate this, but the term legend is used a lot um, and, and maybe overused, but it's not overused when you talk about you. I know when I was in Blackpool, um, you know, you've done everything and it goes back so far, but where, where did it start for you in terms of this side of the industry? Well, I was born on a circus. Uh, yeah. My father was the general manager and my mother was an acrobat on elephants. And she used to do the famous trick where she'd lay down on the ring and the elephant would hover its foot over her face. So you can recognise my mum, her face is three feet wide and an inch deep. <laughs> That's true. I, I was born on a circus and then they kind of left and my father ran theatres and I wanted to be a, a comedian magician. And I was very lucky to meet Paul Daniels, who not all of your Americans will know, but obviously you will, the greatest magician our country ever produced and a genius of a man. And he taught me uh, so much. And I, so that's what I did. And I was very lucky by the age of 23, I was headlining a show in Jersey, in the Channel Islands. And, but what I could see was that it was the 80s and alternative comedy was coming in and the shows we did were going out. And your American uh, viewers may not be quite aware, but obviously they know that Bucky's done uh, Branson. You've probably heard of Myrtle Beach. Yes. Well, our equivalent in England is that we have about 20 seaside towns where we used to put summer shows on and people used to go there on the holidays. Uh, and they were variety reviews. And in the winter, we had a thing called pantomime. And that's like a musical theatre for, for uh, you know, family audience. And they were the two things that interested me. And what was happening was that no one was putting those shows on anymore. And I met a guy who was just the same age as me. We were only in our early, very early 20s. And we just had this idea, well, we, we could do a show. If no one will employ us, we'll do a show ourselves. And within four years, he basically, he did the business and I did the show. And we were in show business. And, and I had to stop performing because we got so busy. And we were huge. I, I mean, for... 15, 20 years, we would employ a thousand artists every year. And we did shows all over the country that moved us into then representing talent, especially younger performers like myself. Then we brought them through to become stars and we had 25 amazing years and I could see it was falling over. And funny enough, just before we came on air, Bucky and I were talking about our mutual friend, Jimmy Osmond and Jimmy uh, rang me and said, look, I've heard you do these shows in Blackpool. Would you work with me? Would I work with him? You know, I was a boyhood dream, the Osmonds, you know. And uh, so Jimmy and I did loads of stuff. And we even took a show out to China with Marie's son, Stephen. And we did a version of Aladdin uh, with, with Stephen out there. Um, and then the other partner I'd worked with, we sort of split up. We wanted to do different things. I wanted to move into television and, and movies as such. But we were very famous for doing these um, pantomimes. I did a, a remarkable show called Truth Lies Diana, I know you had Kent Gavin on uh, the other week uh, about the death of Princess Diana. Um, I did it on Broadway. I actually played for the first time in 25 years. I went back on stage and played the lead myself. And it was about a guy uh, investigating what happened to Diana after she died. Not about the lead up to it. It was about afterwards. And, and I did a, a big uh, exhibition of uh, a Chinese light lantern show. And then I started moving into arena shows. And my previous business partner just wanted to stay and still does it. And he's very successful. But I've always wanted to have a, a career and do things that interested me. Uh, and so I've been able the last 10 years to diversify into doing all these different things. And uh, not bad for a circus boy. Well, the, uh, the, the yeah, yeah, that's a bit of an understatement. The uh, the truth lies, Diana. You said you did it on Broadway. How was that over here? Because massive royalists over here in the uh, in the states who were enamoured by the royal family and everything about them, especially Diana. Well, I, I met a, a man who knew a man um, who had the only transcript outside of government established circles of the inquest, and I had met socially Paul Burrell her butler. And then I managed to meet Muhammad Al-Fayed. I told him what I was doing, what I was interested in. And he was very gracious and uh, met me a couple of times. And I just found out all this astonishing information. And then I met the guy who uh, actually led the defence, uh, if you will, about you know what happened to, on Diana's behalf. And so the play was about what happened after she died, the, the premise being everything up to the crash looked like an accident. Everything mm. after looked like a cover up. And what was fascinating about it was it, the play was me playing myself, meeting all these other people. 
and no lines were invented. Every character, whether it was Paul Borrell or Trevor Reese Jones, the bodyguard who allegedly survived with amnesia, other than Bobby Ewing, I don't know anybody else who came out of the shower and you know didn't remember the last seven years. Uh, Henri Paul, the driver, who they pinned it on, said he was drunk when clearly he wasn't. I I reproduced all the words that they had either said at the inquest or on a televised interview. And we used those words and made it into a drama. So the reason we did it in America first was that we knew that we would be badly received in England. So we tried it out at the Jerry Allback in Times Square for a week. And then without telling anybody, I opened it at the Savoy in London. And we ran six weeks before they closed us. And literally, the establishment got together and, and sort of uh, shut us down. Um, I, I won't go into kind of all of that and how and why. They just didn't want the story to be told. And it's astonishing because they do. close to home. They what? I said you hit a little too close to home. Well, yeah, and you, you, know, you see films about the, the Kennedy assassination and about yeah. the Queen herself. Yes. Well, why are you objecting to this? But the, the hate campaign of people digging in my dustbins and breaking into my house, literally, uh, it was uncomfortable for my family. And that's in the end why we said, look, enough's enough. Wow. Wow, I think it's got. Uh, I think it's got musical written all over this. Well, I, I think the trouble is with music is that it tends to trivialise it. We do intend on the twenty fifth anniversary to launch it again, and the guys at William Morris have said that they would help me produce it to do it as a sort of a two man play rather than we had seven actors in it before uh, and everybody playing all these different parts. But but what was fascinating is we used to say to the audience. At this, I opened the shows myself. I said, well, this is me and this is what I do. Um, what do you think? And we asked the audience to vote by hands. Halfway through, I said, what do you think now? And at the end of the play, I said, now look, we've presented both sides of the argument. What do you think? You're the jury. And it changed from we think that it was an accident to this was no accident. And, of course, the interesting thing is that the verdict was... Uh, that um, it was never proved that she was uh, not killed. Um, and they never, they said her death was caused by people unknown. Well, the people unknown were the supposed outriders on the motorbikes who caused the car to crash, whether deliberately or accidentally. And yet no other paparazzi ever knew who they were. Their pictures never went anywhere. The police never traced them. But we could spend three hours talking about it. But it was a fascinating thing that my previous business partner didn't want to get involved in. Um, and it was interesting to do, you know, career change for me. Wow, that's interesting stuff. Jesus, like you say, it could be a whole, uh, a whole other show just on that. It's got, and it's got everybody chatting on our little commentary here about that's that's amazing. Can I can I go back a little bit? I want to go back. We on our show, uh, I think we're on our something like fortieth episode or something. A lot of people that I know, a lot of people that I know of, never met as in today. Um, but I talk about this two or three degrees of separation. Now with Bookie, it's tenors of rock because we know so many people we know in in Vegas. I think we both know Mike Maloney really well and a bunch of people like that in Vegas. With us, John, um, I think there's a number of people. First of all, there's the Gilbert connection. And uh, that's freaked me out, to be honest, because usually I get I get people going, well, why, why Gilbert, you know? And it seems like you might be, so let me just reel off a couple of lyrics. you got to give me the, but you, you got to be on the ball there, okay? Um, I've no wish to hurry a lot, but have you seen the time? It's quarter to ten, you got to be there at nine. I don't think the registrar will be very pleased if we show up an hour late like two frozen peas. It's called matrimony. It is. If I give up the seat I've been saving... To some elderly lady or man. Uh, uh, yeah, nothing rhymed. Absolutely. That's one of the best. Um, um, what was the other one? I, just, I had something, I had it written on my other screen here. Um, uh, but that permissive twit that you mentioned earlier, that yeah. was, for people who don't know, this was a guy who came out in early 1972 and he was managed by the same guy who had Ingelbert and Tom Jones. And he turned up as a like a little... Mm, Victorian urchin with a big cap and short trousers. And in fact, he was a very good looking man. And he wrote these astonishingly quirky lyrics that I'm sure a lot of your viewers will remember alone again, which was number one for several weeks in America. Yeah, that's really so, do you know the story of Andy Williams and Gilbert O'Sullivan? No. 
So Andy recorded a Gilbert song. He recorded the one again, naturally, but he wanted to record another one. And he called Ray and said, um, there's only one problem with one of the words. I don't know what Bagsy means. <laughs> And the song was We Will, and the words were, on Sunday next, if the weather holds, we'll have that game, um, but I Bagsy being in goals. And he, Andy didn't know what the word Bagsy was, and I think he changed it in his recording. Because <laughs> he'd never grown up in Fazakali, that's why. <laughs> Here's a tough one for you, John. Let's see if I can remember that. Uh, do what you want to within reason, but remember, take your time. Nothing stops for those who can't afford to wait. Oh, you've got me on that. Oh, I love it. <laughs> the best advice that I can give you is to hold on to your head, but as long as you are good and kind, you'll always be a friend of mine. So is that a friend of mine? Do you know that one? I don't know. I'm a writer, not a fighter. Yeah, I'm a bit of a Gilbert nutcase, but... Um, I so think you win then. We're going to have to talk. We're going to have to talk after this show. I'm going to go, I'm going to go off in left field there a little bit, but um, so we live here in Phoenix, my wife and I, and... Um, we were good. we we live half the year in Mexico, and we were going to move from here and sell the house. And we decided about six months ago, ah, you know what, our sons are we're just going to stay here. So we decided to remodel. And in uh, in the middle of the house, I've got this little piano bar. We've got a baby grand and a bar, and uh, we can see about twenty people. And I found out that Gilbert rescheduled his tour for next year in LA. So right now, I'm actively working on uh, doing a private Gilbert show here. So, John, you're going to have to come over with Sam and Linda and sit yeah. and we'll geek out to whack a do whack a day <laughs> You know, it, it's an amazing thing about things from our, our childhood. One of the things I've been doing, I don't know if you, you, you guys have, we've got all this time on our hands at the moment, so I've been looking through my phone directory and ringing friends who I haven't spoken to for a while. And they've said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, we did this, and they sent me some pictures. So I got a picture the other day of me with Debbie Reynolds. Now, Debbie Reynolds, you know, to me, in front of How the West Was One was on the other week, and from being a little boy, you know, that cute, pert little blonde was kind of my idea. Well, that's what a girl should look like. So we did the show Simply Ballroom uh, in, in Vegas, actually, Bucky. We reopened the Golden Nugget about 2008. It had been closed for a while. And then we took the show on tour, and we got Debbie to be the host. So it's like stars, what do they call it, Dancing with the Stars you have there. In England, it was something different. So it was the first ballroom show of its kind. So I go over to some home in the Laurel Canyon to meet her, and this frail old lady says to me, you won't know who I am, but I'm Princess Leia's mother. So I said, of course I know who you are. No, I've come here to see you, to book you. And she was a bit frail. And then she said, what do you want me to do? I can't dance. You know, I'm 70-something. I said, I I just want you to introduce the stuff and tell people about your life as you do it. And so if, if I may, I'm going to tell you a quick, my favourite Debbie Reynolds story. So she yeah. tells me this story. She's in Singing in the Rain. It's her first ever movie, and she's not even a very good dancer. And no one's really being friendly with her, and she's on a stepladder before they do this big number with Gene Kelly. And she says, I'm chewing gum. And the bell goes, they're going to start shooting. I don't know what to do with the chewing gum. So I stick it on the rung of the stepladder. Gene Kelly, they swoons over, and he leans back, looks up the stepladder. What I don't know, and nobody knows, is Gene Kelly wore a hairpiece. And as he leant back, the chewing gum oh, stuck no. to the hairpiece and pulled it off, revealing a ball patch. Gene Kelly goes mad. She said, I run down the stepladder, and I run out into the next sound studio, and I hide under a piano. She says, the door opens, and from under the piano, I see a pair of shoes walking towards me. And a hand comes down and says, come on, little girl, it's not that bad. Is Mr. Kelly being horrible to you? And she said, yes, he is. <laughs> and he said, what's the matter? I can't do the dance. He said, don't worry, I'll help you. And so this hand came down and helped me up from under the piano. And that, she said, is how I met Fred Astaire. Oh, my goodness. Now, when the real lady tells you a story about Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire, I was just like putty in her hands. Oh. We had the most wonderful four months. We toured state to state, coast to coast. Um, and she did show, so, uh, stories like that every night in the show. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Is that, is that the show that Sam was, uh, that Sam was yeah, in? He did. It, indeed, he did. Um, we had a couple of winners from uh, Stars and uh, whatever you call it, Pop Idol. And, uh, and then Sam came over and he did the last leg of the tour. Yeah. Uh, he opened in Santa Barbara, a beautiful theatre down there. 
Yeah, it's gorgeous. I believe, um, again, two degrees of separation. I believe you're the, the you're the reason why Sam and Linda got together. Well, that's right. I mean, I don't know if you guys know this, but Linda was a very famous model and I started a manager and she was then an actress and we were doing Snow White and Linda was a very sexy girl and, and quite, you know, uh, it was for her to play Snow White, the original virgin, it was an unusual casting. So Sam w was so good when I first met him, he was in a show for me and I said, look, how much are we paying you? And he said, you're paying me $500 a week. I said, I'm robbing you. I'm going to give you a raise to $800. Because if it wasn't you, the show would be pants. And he'd never forgotten that story. So I said, right, next year I'm going to put you with Linda Lusardi. And I went down, and there's a scene where the prince kisses Snow White by the wishing well. And uh, I went, I said, are you two having an affair? And it went a bit red. And he said, why would you think that? I said, I've written this show and directed it for five years. The kiss lasts three seconds. I said, when the lights went out, you were still snogging and tongues and everything for about <laughs> ten seconds. What do I need to know? And I introduced them. That's brilliant. Oh, man. <laughs> That's brilliant. I think uh, I met Sam uh, about 18 months before that panto. And then in, in, the, uh, in the beginnings of the relationship, we come over to Blackpool and stay at ours. But um, the one thing I can say, and I think you'll agree, um, any, any celebrities out there, the, the media have got their own opinion and people, the public have their own opinion. And there are no two nicer, kinder, more genuine people than, uh, than Sam and Linda. Without a doubt, we love them to death. No, for sure. And you know, they both got COVID about five, six weeks ago and uh, both at the same time. And of course, uh, Lucy, their daughter was already staying somewhere else, but Jack, who's 17, 18, was there in the house on his own. We have a very famous comedian here called Bradley Walsh. You Americans might know him from Doctor Who, but he does The Chase and Sunday Night at the Palladium, and he was the star of the British Law and Order. And um, anyway, I introduced Brad to his wife in, the, in a show that Linda was headlining in 1990, and we've all been friends for 30-odd years. And uh, the nation kind of followed Linda and Sam's illness, uh, mm. daily because it was one of the first big name stars to, um, to to be and the fact that both husband and wife were and you're right and you know what Bucky was saying earlier about teaching his students you know the one thing I feel sorry for this younger generation now is you don't always work in a gang of people you know and those stories you tell I mean that must have been great with those horn dogs with people I can see it now these guys just coming and jamming with you and just the current generation it's not their fault but you don't get those opportunities anymore no. so we always had a show with lots of people in them and they were lovely people oh yeah the panto stuff I mean you're a legend in the panto world but it's in the do you know much about panto bookie uh you know I don't I, I'm really I, I'm very interested to hear, to hear more about this, though. It's a very cultural thing, the very uh, British uh, Britishisms. Actually, my, my, John, my wife just uh, commented on the feed, you should have your own match.com. <laughs> <laughs> That's been said by many an act. But uh, the pencil things, uh, it, from outside of the UK, it's weird because it only happens in December. I think it used to go longer into January. So it's a Christmas show, but it's a fairy tale. Um, but it attracts the biggest stars. I mean, in, in I don't know if it's still the same, but in the old days, I mean, everybody who was anybody would be on in, in Panto. And John was well, right. They it is, it's all the Disney titles. I mean, Disney don't own the titles because the stories are 200 years old. It's Snow White and Cinderella and Peter Pan. And we've done it in theatres for years. And I had this idea on my own to do it in arenas. So we created Peter Pan in an arena. And the Bradley Walsh, the guy I just mentioned, huge star in our country. And would you believe I had Spandau Ballet in it as well? No. You got, for sure, yeah. The, the Cray Brothers. <laughs> yeah, Martin Kemp. From the craze, yeah. he played Captain Hook. You're I don't kidding. Know what of it. I don't know if I sent you what it is. But we did it at Wembley Arena, and we have a full size, life size galleon that is on wheels that coasts around the arena with 70 water fountains pumping out as it goes around. And we play to 6,000 people in a half size uh, arena. So we sort of supersize the idea of pantomime into arenas. And that's incredible. Uh, it's brilliant. I know the uh, we've got some video of uh, of Peter Pan here. Just check out this video one of John's put up. Good. Wrap her up, tear her up, throw her overboard. The 
Fishes need their daily feed and the pleasure will be our reward. She'll feed the sharks and let me be frank. I'll make my day, make pizza pay, make, make her walk the plank. Your productions are stunning, John. They always I was say to, to stage something like that. Holy cow! Yeah. It's never been done before, apart from Fell touring Disney. There is no family show of that size, and everybody said you're mad. Only you know, only you would be mad enough to try. It. But I was born in a circus, and I've always wanted to do new and different things. And um, it, well, I was incredibly proud of it. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. Amazing. Like I said, and I say this with many guests, but it's definitely today with both of you today, we could spend, spend all day on it. And people would be, be, be uh, in fact, I'm looking at our number count people watching and no one's leaving the show. And that happens all the time on Facebook and YouTube. We're all clicking away to get somewhere. No one's leaving. Well, well listen, I made a friend cause I'd, I'd love all that stuff that Bucky's doing. And I took my son over for his 21st and we had a, a week in Vegas and we did the skydive 15,000 foot jump. Yeah. Ooh. And I took him shooting and horse riding and everything. And we saw quite a number of shows, but when we come over, as soon as it's clear, I'm coming front row because I love what you do. Oh, listen, uh, I want, I want to, uh, before we get out of here to make sure we get each other's numbers and all that stuff, because it's, it's been a pleasure to meet both of you guys for sure. But, uh, but I would love to keep in touch and, uh, and, and please, if you, if you do make to Vegas, either one of you guys, uh, please get in touch with me. We'd love you to be our guest. So, VIP treatment. We'll come backstage afterwards and then maybe go for dinner. Absolutely done, but we're not going anywhere yet. We're going to Where in the World is Terry. Check this. Where in the World is Terry? Where in the World is Terry? All right, this is the part of the show where we move where I am. We change my background. It's pretty simple. I'll do that. John, any idea where that is? I know you've done a show or two here. Was that Liverpool? It is Liverpool, yeah. It's it Liverpool. I didn't think it was going to be that easy. I, know, but it's, it's, it's I was going to say Little Rock. <laughs> just on, over your left shoulder is the Liverpool Echo Arena. That's where we did Elf last year. Okay, listen, you're the first person that's ever said that because I ask what that is because it always it throws people. They, they forget the live buildings and they look at that and go, what, what's that building there? So yeah, you, we did the same supersized version treatment for Elf, the musical, uh, and we opened the tour there last year. All right. Well, that's not the question. That was an easy giveaway. You know, I'll do things like that. Do you know where that is? It's a little more difficult, but... Is that the repository building in uh, Dallas? You're on the ball. The school book depository where... Uh... I don't get out much. <laughs> they don't shoot presidents, that's why. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's an easy one for Bucky. Oh, the Great Wall. Hey, did I get that right? <laughs> however, however, that's not it. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to play a video. It's going to sweep me through um, a city, a famous city in the world. You've got to tell me what city I'm in. So I'm going to start here, and uh, I hope some of the text doesn't give it away because I haven't checked them today. But uh, this is for Bucky. Bucky, check this out. Where am I in the world? So it's just going to get this little drone of the city. You can see it's quite European and it's got water. Uh, yeah. How's that? I should know, shouldn't I? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, cruise people would know it. It's not the easiest thing, but the... Uh, Let me... Uh... See, the girls should give it away. God, you know, I don't know. All right, we'll give you some clue. Have you got any idea, John? Is it somewhere in Canada? It's not. No, it's Europe. Is it, is it in the States? 
It is in Europe and it's Scandinavia. They're trying to make it in the States for some reason. Well, Venice is the only place with that much water, but... A little tough, this one, isn't it? That's the shopping centre in the middle of it. Do you want a clue? The the ABBA Museum is there. Was it Stockholm? Yes, yeah, Stockholm. Stockholm, Sweden. See, I did shows on Royal Caribbean for many years, but we only did Vancouver in the American run. I never did uh, the Norwegian Fjords. We did Alaska. What shows did you guys do for Royal Caribbean? I produced all their shows and created new ones for them. In fact, most of them are still running. Uh, Sirens, the pirate show, and Land of Make Believe. Uh, the ballroom show is on there, and we did the celebrity cruise lines. There are four ships on there. This, uh, how long ago was this? Still... Uh, 2010 to 14. Were you working um, with Christy Coachman? With Christy Coachman? By any no. chance? I was just curious who that, who you're... Eric Boas was the VP. Okay, okay, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, the Royal Caribbean's a great line, man. I was with them for four years. Wonderful. Yeah. Small world. It's a small world. All right. The bottom line, even though you deflected it, you sucked on that. You didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna go. We're gonna go with uh, this one for uh, for John. There's a couple of giveaways on this, John. Well, it's a bit tricky. Copenhagen. Yeah, you nailed it. What hey, give I did the pronunciation as well. Yeah, you did. What give it away? Uh, because uh, I did a show at Tivoli Gardens. Well, I didn't do it in the end, but I went to Tivoli Gardens uh, to do it. Yeah, they do a lot of cycling there. I and actually, I'll tell you something else. Uh, the I have a thing about the world's worst because you know, like we've all done ships and travelled. So I have a thing about the world's worst tourist attractions. Okay, and one of them is Waikiki Beach because it's so small. And it's full of people. But another one is, I don't know if that was on there, the Little Mermaid in Copenhagen. Because yeah. to get to it is a really long walk around the harbour. It's tiny. It's like the size of an eight-year-old girl. And vandals have used a chainsaw to cut its head off seven times. So she actually has a welded collar. And the head is not quite right the way it's stuck by her. Very disappointing. Yeah, it's funny, I, I did a West Side Story in 1989 with Jody Benson uh, that did the, ended up doing the voice of the Little Mermaid. Uh, oh, wow. she's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, she said, I'm working on this music, this thing for Disney. Uh, and she was just doing the voiceovers at the time. And we, she came down to Birmingham. She's from Alabama to do this regional theater production. We were doing a West Side Story. And then Little Mermaid took off and we were all like, holy cow. <laughs> well, I gave you Copenhagen because of your random act of kindness yesterday, John. Thank you. To link it in that with that. Uh, I feel. I have a feeling I'm going to really suck at this pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, look, we don't have any more. That was it. Well, I, I, I am going to give you one more because no one's got this. But I, th I thought it was quite easy. I have a feeling that uh, that John will nail this one. Uh, that's. Dubai, is it? It is Dubai. Yeah. Have you done shows there, John? Yeah. Yeah, I've done two shows there. There's the Palms. Love that place. I mean, I just love that that city. It's exciting as heck, you know? Yeah. Great. My, uh, my uh, ex-wife was quite, it was in EastEnders, which is our big, as you know, our big uh, soap for many years. And uh, we went out for New Year a few years ago and we were in the hotel and <laughs> in the line in the buffet next to us was the actor who played her brother for 13 years on the show, who she hadn't seen for five years. But we'd gone to get away from it all for a romantic New Year's Eve. And we bumped into a load of people that we knew. And I was really tired and they had that huge fireworks display and it was when the bloody thing caught fire the big hotel caught fire and i slept through the whole thing i had no idea wow 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 yeah. all right we're going to go to the uh, the question we ask guests on every single show and the question is this for you two um if you could spend the next 60 minutes with any two people dead or alive it could be people you know or historical figures or anyone Spend the next 60 minutes with two people in one place anywhere on earth. Who would you spend the next hour with? Where would you go? 
and what would you talk about? John, you. Well, I would have said because of the Princess Diana thing, I'd like Henri Paul and Trevor East Jones in the Ritz Hotel in Paris, and I'd like to ask them what actually happened. But since we've been talking today, I would like to be in a bar with you and Gilbert O'Sullivan <laughs> and a piano and that we could teach Bucky the lyrics to some of those songs. I would love it. <laughs> I am all over that. I'm going to spend the next few months working on that very scenario. Bucky, go down and look at the lyrics for Ooh Wacka Doo Wacka Day. Sounds like Little Latin Loopy Lou. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's 20,000 people watching this podcast. Going, Who the heck is Gilbert Wilson? What are these guys talking about? Yeah, but we're going to enhance their lives if they go and search. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? <laughs> it does. It sounds like uh, ooh, what could do? It sounds like uh, Bill's. You know, their first hit was Little Latin Loopy Lou, and <laughs> Bill wrote it. He said, "You know," he goes, "I'm I'm still having the time of my life. I'm almost eighty years old, and I'm still singing Little Latin Lou." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. What about you, um, Bucky? Two people. Me, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little sentimental and a little. Um, uh, you know, I told you guys I was a big Kiss fan growing up, and because I, I was, you know, and I'm a theater guy, so I, uh, you know, the dramatics of Kiss with the makeup, you know, in the '70s when I was growing up was a kid, you know, that was just really wild to me. And 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 Bill makes fun of me all the time. He's on stage and he says, uh, you know, if you say if you say the word Kiss, he goes, I don't know if you've noticed, there's a little age difference between me and Buck. You know, he goes, if you if you say Kiss to Bucky, he thinks about the band with the makeup and the. You know, and all, he sticks his tongue out. And he goes, if you stay kissed to me, I'm on my way to second base. <laughs> but I would probably, I've always wanted to go to Australia. So I, I would probably be on a beach in Australia somewhere. And I'd love to meet the guy that uh, I really feel like taught me to sing, uh, Paul Stanley from Kiss. My parents used to punish me by taking my Kiss albums away. And I'm sure you guys are aware when in 07, 08, when, when Kiss would take a break, Paul was doing Phantom of the Opera in, uh, in, in, in Toronto. You know, you can look it up online, him singing Music of the Night. He's classically trained. That's what I tell my students, too. I say, if you want to be a better rock singer, train the classics. If you want to be a better pop singer. The, the, the classics and the Broadway sound is for singers what – Ballet is for dancers. Every other form stems off of that. But I would want to be with Paul Stanley, and uh, and I lost my mom uh, real young. She was fifty eight, uh, and uh, boy, I'd love to. I would love to sit with them on a beach and talk about my career, and and uh, and ask my mom why she took my took my Kiss albums away to punish me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be great? But I would. But people would ask me. They asked me who taught me to sing. What did you learn to sing? I said, Well, Paul Stanley. And they go, what? I'm like, yeah, I would sit in my room. You know, back then you didn't have vocal lessons and everything like you have nowadays. You sit in your room, you play your favorite songs, you sing them. If it hurts your throat, you find a different way to do it. But I would play my, my albums from front to back. And my first album, you know, I'm a big old school fan. But like I said, the dramatics of Kiss was, was just always what attracted me to it. I think that's what eventually led me, uh, you know, to the theater. That's great. Well, we've had 40 or so episodes, and I don't think we've had any answer quite as diverse as your mum, Paul Stanley, a beat <laughs> in a pub. I Can I ask Bucky a question? Yeah. Who's that guy stood behind you? Oh, that's, uh, that's Steely Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he made the trip. I, I, we were we were down in a, in, in a place called Eureka Springs on our anniversary. My wife and I just celebrated our 25th anniversary, and we're we're riding and we're, I got a convertible and we go by and it's a cool little crafts artsy town. And I see this guy out out front and my and I said, oh, I gotta have him. And I said, my wife said, no, we're not getting him. And I said, well, if I can get him for less than 200, can I take him home? She goes, there's no way. So I went in and told the guys our anniversary. I bartered with him. I took him home for 175 bucks. So he's in the convertible. <laughs> With him. I said, you know, he's coming to Vegas. And so he was sitting close to the door. My wife said he scared the hell out of her. every time she comes in, she jumps out of her skin. So I've got him over in the corner next to my piano. Fab. Steely Dan. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Well, look, he's in Las Vegas. Um, uh, John's somewhere near Windsor. What's the place called, John? Uh, I live in Gerard's Cross, but you, you Americans would know it near Windsor Castle. Near Windsor. Thank you both for being on the show. This has been a blast today. Oh, I've had such a great time. 
our shows are like usually like 35, 40 minutes, and uh, we might drag it out a little bit more if the show's going well. We're at an hour five and going strong. It's been great. It's gone by like that for me. It's been brilliant. And, uh, of course, very excited to be able to talk about Gilbert O'Sullivan and someone not look at me like I'm stupid. So uh, thanks to John and Bucky for being on the show. It's been great having you as guests. Stick around. I want to say hi after the show. Um, thanks to everyone joining us today. It's been great. If you want to re see a rerun of this, go on to our YouTube uh, channel at Tad Talk and check out all the episodes. It's been great. Great guests this week, including uh, Say As You See or See As You Say or uh, whatever that saying is. Roy Walker's with us tomorrow. We've got some great acts coming on for the rest of the weeks. Thanks so much for joining us. Stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you tomorrow on Tad Talk. Thanks a lot.